coffee, coke, weed, wine, ecstasy or Adderall. We're all like playing with substances, but really don't like to talk about it. But on this episode of Deviant TV, we are talking about drug safety, substance use. My name is Michael Marquez, and this is Leon Curry, the one and only. And <laughs> we'd like to welcome you deviants back to Deviant TV. We're going to begin this episode by playing our own card game here, Keep It 100. And we're going to do just that. We're going to keep it 100. Tell the truth today. We're going to try. <laughs> we're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this game is quite simple. We're going to play, uh, start by playing Never Have I Ever. We're going to put up five fingers. And if we've actually done something, we're going to put a finger down. When we run out of fingers, you or I will take a sip of our caffeine. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I guess this is a great time to call your friends, call your family, call your mammy. So they can play together. <laughs> it lets you get to know people for mm -hmm. real. Yeah. Who they really are. <laughs> Who they really are. Set them up. <laughs> so, never have I ever done two or more substances in a night. Dropping a fruit. Okay. Never have I ever done a bump or a line of coke. Never have I ever had sex while high. Never have I ever had five or more drinks in a night. Fuck. Um, <laughs> never have I ever had a bad trip. All right, so I take my hey, sip of caffeine. I'll man. join you in solidarity. Hey Amen. Hey, cheers. Cheers. Mm. So, Leon, <clears throat> we introduced, like, caffeine as a substance, something that, like, alters the mind, wakes you up a little bit in the morning. We don't look at it as... Uh, with the stigma because it's not illicit, it's not mm -hmm. illegal. But we know that some of the substances we name like Coke are technically illegal, um, weren't back in the fucking 80s or mm -hmm. 70s, when whenever the fuck they when it was in Coca-Cola. The good old days. They always talk about how they, how much harder they worked, but God damn it, they had more afforded to them. They was all Coke. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I can get a lot more done too. Anyways, um, Full disclaimer, I do not use Coke on a regular basis. Me either. <laughs> okay. Me either. Me either. Coke. Yes, yes. But no stigma, no shame attached. So. I use God. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> prayer, prayer. <laughs> um, but what happens when substances are made illegal? When something is made illegal, we call it illicit, and it's criminalized. Mm -hmm. Along with criminalization comes stigma. And when yeah. things have stigma, we know that people operate still but they do it in more risky ways. Yeah, and people are gonna be on drugs, and we also have to know the difference between decriminalization and legalization. There are some legal drugs, and there are some drugs we decriminalize, but that doesn't make them legal. And I know back in my experience with drug safety or drug education, I learned from a stuffed cat in the fifth grade. So you can imagine a how this I care cat, okay. but you know, <laughs> Dare and all those programs were just saying, just say no. Yeah. And then when I discovered weed, I was pissed. I was like, say no to this. This is not bad. This mm. is helping me. Yeah. We discussed our caffeine. Many of us mm. as adults need a little something to get us going in the morning. Mm. Doesn't necessarily make us addicts. Doesn't lead to a lot of bad ramifications. But there are still, you know, things that this caffeine does to our brains and mm. our bodies. You know, I think that we talk about drugs like they're this horrible, terrible thing, but we interact with them damn near daily. Uh, yeah. Whether it's caffeine, whether it's sugar, uh, whether it's fat because of how good they taste. Like, mm -hmm. we're constantly intaking things, yeah. and uh, we just really got to talk a little bit more plainly about them so that people aren't doing such risky behaviors. As and I'm glad you brought up addiction because we think of addiction as someone something someone did to themselves when in reality it's just a chemical brain thing. Mm -hmm. It's a sickness that someone yeah. can't help. I don't think anyone wants to be addicted. I think you can give up on trying to get better because yeah. when you look at our world in America, who helps with addiction and treats you like a person still? What help is, what resource is there really long term? Yeah, um, I like that you bring that up because currently those who are struggling with addiction are met with one of two realities. One is police that are coming in this mental health crisis with weapons in hand, not understanding that the person that they're actually interacting with is a victim mm -hmm. of something really very real going on. And I applaud cities like New York 
that now have health professionals to respond mm. to mental health breakdowns as well as those who are suffering from addiction and maybe having a relapse. Uh, there are so many nuanced ways that we can think about responding to addiction, providing people the actual help that they need and not just criminalizing it. Yeah, and also providing their loved ones because most of the times the person who's loving you is going to be the one to take care of you yeah. and that can get exhausting. Like if you had an experience with someone who is truly addicted, yeah. it gets, it's heartbreaking almost and you don't know how to help that person. You don't have resources. I know as a person who works in nightlife, I try to be as responsible as I can, yeah. um, leading people into a place where there is alcohol and drug use. Yeah. You also have city resources that provide you things like Narcan that will stop an overdose yeah. and things like that. Mr. Mark Lockwood, cheers. Cheers. Welcome to Deviant TV. Mm. We are talking about such an interesting subject today, drug safety. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for joining us on this. I know it's not like an easy subject matter to speak on because there's so much stigma and judgment um, as well as like policy and criminalization around the subject matter. Absolutely. So it takes uh, a special someone's uh, champions like yourself to really like get in on the topic. So um, I know that you have work and experience working in harm reduction. Can you tell me a bit how you came into that work? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I came into harm reduction. I always tell this story. So I came in kind of twofold. Um, on the one hand, I came into this work really um, young and sort of seeing the ways in which um, fam members within my family treated my uncle who used uh, substances and not really understanding and grasping, you know, sort of the uh, paternal stigma around that, right? Um, and my Bahamian American family had sensibilities about, you know, sort of morality around what a good person looks like and a mm -hmm. drug user is somebody that shouldn't use. Um, and from a very early age, I didn't understand it because I would talk to my uncle um, who lived with my great grandmother at the time and I spent majority of my time over there um, in my younger years, but I really got a chance to actually talk to him and get to know, you know, his life story about yeah. One, how he came to use, but also life outside of that, right? You yeah. know, he served in Vietnam War, you yeah. know, and worked, you know, in mining and things like that. And really getting to learn him as a person um, and just to see him for literally who he was. Mark, I think that is spectacular. It speaks to the power of empathy, right? Mm -hmm. That was your uncle, somebody, or is your uncle, someone that you love. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, so that's sort of the... I call it informality, but also formality of how I came into this work. And then, you know, I graduated college and, you know, started working um, primarily in HIV outreach is how I started doing more formal based harm reduction work, um, mostly doing HIV testing and hepatitis C testing with folks who engage in this, mostly in the sex trade industry. But there's a clear connection between sort of the intersections of sex work and drug use and using a harm reduction based approach uh, with those respective communities. And so I started doing HIV testing um, and hepatitis C testing with street based sex workers in Newark and in Irvington, New Jersey. Um, then I went on to work at a syringe services program in DC um, for two years as a program manager there. Again, still doing community based outreach, but also on the back end sort of doing grant monitoring for the SSP. And then I went from direct services on to working at the state level where I worked at the Maryland Department of Health, um, monitoring all of our SSPs for the state of Maryland. Um, at the time, I had like a, a really big portfolio of monitoring you know, our SSPs there. And then now I've transitioned on the back end of working at an NGO, doing um, harm reduction work there where I um, do technical assistance for both community-based organizations or harm reduction programs, but also um, state health departments as well. Okay. So I've seen different facets of um, okay. harm reduction. And I, I know this terminology, harm reduction, is really an umbrella for uh, several different things. You know, you mentioned sex work, and uh, we're specifically here to, today talking about drug safety. And uh, I think it is so important that when we're talking about drug safety, at least you know, at Deviant, that we did work to remove the stigma that comes along with folks who may recreationally use drugs or may have an addiction problem, but mm -hmm. are users nonetheless. I think that when we coin terms uh, with 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but when we coin terms with uh, words like harm, it can kind of place a judgment on it that causes people to want to disassociate. They don't want to be looked at as an addictor, uh, excuse me, a drug user or abuser with an addiction. I know that, <clears throat> I know many professionals in my own friend circle who use drugs recreationally, who need this same information and education that there is surrounding drugs, uh, but they don't go and get it because mm -hmm. they don't feel like they are who harm reduction work uh, is, is, is useful for. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that we uh, can change language to like make certain that we're reaching the people in these communities that need to be reached? So when thinking about, I, I want to caution us of not thinking about drug safety as a sort of bedfellow to harm reduction, right? I think it's important to think about how they function constitutively, right? And so the way oftentimes I think about these frameworks, these terminologies, is through a top-down approach, right? So on a macro scale, you have harm reduction, right? Capital HR, lowercase hr, harm reduction. Capital HR being harm reduction through a public health framework, which we understand and know to minimize the harms associated with, I hate this word, but illicit drug use, right? And then we know lowercase hr situated alongside that as a sort of movement to end racialized drug policies, right? However, with that, that's the macro scale. However, on an individual scale or a micro scale, I think that's where drug safety does exist, right? As a sort of wellness and holistic approach and allows the individual, right, to have agency and autonomy over their decisions, right? So it allows them to make informed decisions about the roots of administration for that respective drug. It allows them to, um, to understand sort of, am I in the right mindset, right? Or am I educated about this? It gives them that agency. So I think of them actually functioning together, not as sort of separate terminologies that exist in these, in these worlds. Yeah, and you touched on several points that I think are very important and I'd love to hear you elaborate on. I know that, for instance, you just mentioned race and how that has operated mm -hmm. and how harm reduction policy is really, uh, we're looking to change that or you have like community activists looking to change that because I have been watching all these documentaries and I've learned from them that there was once upon a time that drugs were not as criminalized and regulated as they are today. People were able to access things like marijuana, opioids, um, and even uh, psychedelics once upon a time. But as things kind of came into play, especially race, a lot of things became criminalized. Can, mm. Do you know anything about that? Well, to be frank, and I say this with frank and, <laughs> and, and zero, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm very unapologetic and abashed about how I feel about racialized drug policy because it does exist. And in fact, all, like any policy we can think of, as controversial as this may sound, is always already rooted in anti-blackness, mm -hmm. right? And, or um, racism, frankly. Yeah. Um, and when we trace the genealogy of racialized drug policy, even back to the 1800s, right, where there was an anti-opioid uh, policy that you know, impacted uh, Chinese immigrants, for example, or even in the early 1900s. Um, in fact, it was the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, it was, yes, the jazz era, right? Mm -hmm. That impacted, um, it was the anti-marijuana uh, policy that impacted Mexican Americans and immigrants. Mm -hmm. Even tracing that onward um, to the war on drugs starting in the 70s and trickling into the 80s, uh, both Reagan and Nixon, uh, where, that still to this day impacts black and brown communities. Yeah. I mean, the numbers are, are there. The writings are literally on the wall, right? Yeah. Every 23 seconds, someone is being arrested for drug possession, right? Um, last year alone, 1.5 million people were arrested. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, imagine one in three black men are arrested for drug possession, particularly marijuana, right? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I have many friends I can count on my hand and imagine three of them, let's say I have four friends, three of us are gonna be likely arrested wow. for drug possession. Mm. So I think there's something to be said about sort of the, the ways in which these policies really disproportionately affect black and brown people. Yeah. 
And we know that these punitive policies have no measures at all for minimizing drug use at all. Right. Like right. there's no data that shows that, you know, a higher, you know, higher crime, I mean, higher uh, sort of uh, enactment of these policies, right, actually uh, reduce drug possession or reduce drug addiction or drug use. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah, I sort of saw this, uh, this saying or slogan earlier that we cannot stop people from having sex. We can only make it more safer or more dangerous. Mm -hmm. We cannot stop people from uh, having access to abortion, women from having access to uh, bodily autonomy. We can only make it safer or more dangerous. And we can't stop people from using drugs. We can only make it safer or more dangerous. Precisely. And that's exactly what I'm like hoping that we begin to do as a community um, and also as a, as a country is mm -hmm. actually making things safer for our communities that are heavily impacted. When we think about black and brown people, specifically in the queer community who we serve, I know that at Deviant, we are looked at as this new environment for black and brown queer people to come and enjoy it. And as they take agency over their lives, over their bodies and their sexual lives, they also are taking agencies over their souls and what they want to uh, partake in and explore. And I definitely feel the onus uh, and the responsibility to get them the information they need to stay safe, Absolutely. to make wise decisions. And I wish that there were more organizations out there to offer them to point to uh, harm reduction research, but also just so that we're reaching our community of professionals, because we exist in, you know, outside of a vacuum. We're not a monolith. Uh, I, I wish that there were more access to information. I think that you know the conversation you and I are having today is really to kind of mm. uncover and uh, destigmatize, destigmatize this uh, this really prevalent issue that does impact our community. It's always been impacting us as Black and Brown people, uh, and now very specifically as queer people, and God, I guess always has, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I can talk about harm reduction for eons, but there are many. In fact, you know tons of harm reduction organizations out there. In fact, you know, in Atlanta right now, that we have um, the Atlanta Harm Reduction Coalition is one that I can think of. But as you're pointing out, these programs are important yeah. and need to be implemented. In fact, um, studies have shown that many folks that enter into syringe services programs or any harm reduction program for that nature are actually five times likely to even go into recovery, right? Mm -hmm. And for some, that may not necessarily be the goal, right? Recovery yeah. as the end, the end goal. Yeah. And that's also okay. Yeah. But the fact, as you're pointing out, or as you just beautifully articulated, is that they have the knowledge, right, right? right? And that's important. And I know that some models do exist now. We have Oregon that just decriminalized mm. all substance, uh, substances. We also have countries like Portugal. Portugal. Mm. Uh, what sort of like stats and data and results have we seen out of places like that? Well, we know with... And, particular from a global context with Portugal as a case study that Portugal, in fact, you know, did drug decriminalization about now 10 years ago, right? And so with Portugal as an interesting case, when they reduced, when they did the drug decriminalization policy, it actually decreased HIV rates um, in Portugal, right? So their numbers, I think, dropped to like 6.8%, right? Mm. More folks started to enter into harm reduction programs as an evidence-based, right? Now they had little interactions with law enforcement, which should be the goal in the first place, right? right. Law enforcement are public servants. Law enforcement is public servants, right? Or are public servants, sorry, right? And mm -hmm. so you know, now they're not interacting with, the, with law enforcement as much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, stigma as an end goal it has been eradicated as a result of that. So now folks can actively talk about drug use, right? And not be seen um, in a sort of, as a moral failure to society, right? In these particular ways. Yeah. So that's why um, drug decriminalization is important. Mark, I just want to thank you so much for offering your thoughts, your life's work, and yeah, your time with us today here on Deviant TV. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I know that uh, we at Deviant are like a new hot commodity when it comes to nightlife as well. And along with the circuit culture that we're introducing people to, uh, when they exit our premises or even when they enter our premises, they come with these preconceived notions that they also got to try all the drugs that the white boys do at the, the larger circuit parties. And so they're popping pills that they don't even know what the fuck it is. Mm -hmm. Don't know if I can say that. But... <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know what it is. And, you know, I definitely feel an onus to meet them 
uh, with information and resources so that they're staying safe. Yeah. And I think that that is a responsibility that we have in nightlife to really think about what we're introducing folks to, even if it's just alcohol. Alcohol is one of the most dangerous substances that there are. And we see people get in multiple car accidents while driving impaired, um, making bad decisions, having their decisions impaired altogether, mm. and waking up next to complete strangers. Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but also with alcohol, because we know that's a thing, and that's sometimes our money maker. I like to tell people something that I heard that I thought was more impactful than don't do that, don't do this, was yes. test your drugs. Yes. Um, I feel like they tell you that downtown. Mm -hmm. And there are just different rhetorics when we talk about drug use. I know you can go into a clinic and it's hard to be truthful about what you've done yes. because you know you have people are going to look at you like, oh, just another person on drugs. Yes. But there is a lot of great information. Like I did not know a drink was basically considered a shot. So you said like five drinks is mm -hmm. binge drinking. Mm -hmm. I've been binging binge drinking from Thursday to Sunday and not even realizing it because yeah. the amount of alcohol that's considered a drink is so little. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do know, that, again, that substances are a large part of our reality. And I think even, especially as queer people of color, they're even more of our reality. So I want to read some things here from you, or for you, rather. Uh, queer folks are twice as likely to use and abuse substances and twice as likely to have mental health issues. That is according to a 2015 national survey on drug use and health. Mm. We as a queer population, we especially as a minority queer population, are that much more likely to have both mental health issues as well as interact with substances. Mm. And I'm just gonna hypothesize here that we're interacting with, several with some of these substances as an act or means of escapism. Yeah, and also it seems to be a part of, I don't want to say a part of the culture, but it's easily accessible. Yes. You know, I think we've discussed earlier, being queer means to be around a lot of your peers. You know, you can have a gay mother, gay father, but they're only a few years older than you. Yeah. So they can tell you what they know, yeah. and sometimes they've come from a more hardship than you. Yeah. So they're trying to tell you how to cope in a way that was realistic for them to cope, yeah. and in a trustworthy way. And I think um, some people are trying to turn you out, some people are trying to hurt you. Yeah. But some people just don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, only when you know better can you do better. Mm -hmm. And right now, I mean, I think that is the goal, really, is getting people the proper information and resources. Speaking of information, you brought up uh, several different things that I think are so important to highlight. You brought up Narcan. Mm -hmm. Narcan is useful in case anybody ever overdoses. You take something or something's in your drink that you don't know of anywhere you're having this reaction. Narcan is something that you can take and that they afford to you in clubs, I know in New York, yeah. um, but also in DC and uh, in Atlanta, you can pick it up in a local pharmacy and it can help counteract the impacts of an overdose. And it also helps with being roofied. I have experienced yeah. someone being roofied once and that is not a pleasant thing at all. That is ex it's even beyond what you see in a movie. It's a person's dead weight yeah. and someone has to be responsible for that person to move that person, and when the ambulance came, when I experienced it, they treated him as an overdose, and I'm like, okay, I have to think, and this may not be the thinking of the medical professionals, but my thinking is like, we are black people, we're queer people, how are they gonna treat this person? Yeah. And they was like, oh, he's ODing, give him the Narcon, and just trying to, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, I was just scared, yeah. but to know that piece of information, like, it also helps with, if your friend's been roofied, you can ask the bar, hey, do you have any Narcan? Something's happening. Yeah, yeah. You also brought up testing strips. So if you are doing things like cocaine or even, I guess, pills nowadays that are being laced mm, with, with fentanyl. Fentanyl. Fentanyl is deadly, but there are things called fentanyl strips that you can also pick up at your local pharmacy. Um, and many times we make them available at at least deviant events with our healthcare partners. Those fentanyl strips you can use to test whatever substances or drugs you're going to use to make certain that if you are experimenting or exploring, you're not gonna die that night. And that is so important for people to know. Like fentanyl, there's like actually an outbreak yeah. right now in the US. And how can we care for someone who is maybe not even an addict, but someone who has experimented and just feels bad, like they don't know how to do yeah. what they're doing? Well, I think that a level of that care is what we're doing right now, right here, right now, having a conversation that destigmatizes the use of substances and really steers them towards getting information and resources. Again, I think the reality is facing multiple minority uh, individuals 
is a harsh one, right? Mm -hmm. you, if you are navigating microaggressions uh, in a larger majority white society, and you're also navigating microaggressions within your own black community about you know homophobia or transphobia, that person is going to look for an opportunity to just not think for a second, mm -hmm. to not have to wear a double consciousness and let their hair down. And sometimes a part of that is them having a drink or yeah. smoking a joint or taking a bump. Having a sip, yeah. And we've got to have conversations that are more nuanced than just say no. Welcome back, Deviants. Tonight we are talking about drug safety. And not in the usual sense which you would, that you would think drug safety is about, like not about the reaction you would have to a drug, but just how to navigate in the community where drugs are available and how to be aware and how to keep yourself safe and how to keep yourself from having a bad reaction. Tonight we're sitting with Michael Silas, choreographer, entrepreneur, mm. circuit tops, yes. creator. Yes. Um, you can tell us, I know you have a worldly background being from Germany, LA, Atlanta. Yes, yes, tell us yes. more about yourself. I, am, I come from Germany. I moved to America when I was 11 by way of Houston. I've been living in Los Angeles since 2005. I moved there as a young aspiring dancer and now I sit before you, uh, a choreographer, a dancer that has made every dream come true. When it, and those dreams consisted of dancing with people like Lady Gaga, Mariah Carey, Pussycat Dolls, Mariah, J Mar fuck, Mariah <laughs> Carey, Pussycat Dolls, Lady, Lady Gaga, Mary J. Blige, Chris Brown, Beyonce, Solange, Kelly Rowland, uh, a plethora of people in the Latin community. Um, but I say that humbly and those names humbly because I was a person that had a dream and a vision. And with a dream and a vision, no matter where, wherever you want to take that, I sit here as a testimony that when you take the chance and opportunity with that, you can make things happen. And through that journey, I started my own adventure as a business owner called Circuit Tops. And Circuit Tops is fulfilling a space within the circuit community that is missing. And all of my models and all of my representation of Circuit Tops are people of color. And usually when you step into that world, you don't see much representation of us or with, when it comes to the gear aspect of it, rather it be harnesses, hats, crop tops, whatever it is, the gear is not, re it's not replica to us. Mm -hmm. And all of my models are people of color. So mm -hmm. that's why I created Circuit Tops for it to be a safe space and a celebrated space of people that look like me and my friends in communities that I like to party at. Yeah, and you were telling me how great it was to see all your gear scattered throughout the Deviant parties. Yes, the Deviant party for MLK Weekend was my soft launch for Circuit Tops and their first party at Heretic. And it was just so amazing seeing Micah and so many other people that were there at the party that were the host or were, it were just, just people that were there supporting and my harnesses and my hats. And it just reminded me of a time when I remember my friend Andrew Christian, when I used to go-go mm -hmm. dance, passing out underwear as a young entrepreneur to us go-go go dancers. And now look, he is the leading, yeah. leading brand for uh, the gay community now. Yeah. The question I always have about circuit, yes. because I haven't been to any circuit parties, really not many, one, not the ones that go from like 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> and my question is always, now how do those people stay up <laughs> that whole time? Well, there's many of ways that you can enjoy a circuit party and taking drugs isn't the only way. Mm. But with that music and that energy and atmosphere, being on a level is a euphoric experience. And it's, it's something that only happens in a space like that. Mm. It's kind of similar to where people do things like ayahuasca and they want to have a spiritual experience with drugs. It's the same thing as a gay man going into a circuit party and having that euphoric feeling with your friends, mm. with your partner, or with a stranger that you just met and you just feel that sense of a connection that is the energy of two people meeting, but also the experience of what that chemical release within yourself mm. is doing based off what you're taking. And I love how you put it in the context of ayahuasca like on that spiritual journey mm -hmm. because we never think of a gay party as a spiritual release. Mm -hmm. So there is a way you can do these things and let's not pretend that we're just out here not doing it. If it's present, you might do it, you yeah. might pop it, but there's a safe way to do it yeah. or there's a way to do it to distinct between this euphoria and addiction. Mm -hmm. So how do we like tell our community that, oh, it feels good now, yeah. but how do you help yourself if you are find yourself in an addiction? Well, I feel like anything that you do in an excessive mind frame or behavior pattern is what addiction brings to the table. 
anything that you do from a space of wanting to experience to learn about yourself or learn a new, just a new thing isn't a form of addiction. I think it's very important, first and foremost, anytime you experience with any type of drug to know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. who you're doing it around, where you're getting it from, and most important, what the fuck is inside of it. Yeah. Because what you put inside your body will dictate how your body responds to it. And, and some drugs, yeah, it might be one thing, but just how they cut it is just completely different. Mm -hmm. So just be conscious and be aware and be knowledgeable as much as possible. And if you aren't knowledgeable, ask friends that do it. And there is such a big stigma of people that are pro, um, pro drug takers or just a, a, a safe space of people that are comfortable within their skin to announce that this is what they do because society has such a, a thumbprint on us that it's, it's, it's frowned upon. Mm. But it's all about, again, how you use anything. It's the same thing with, uh, with alcohol or yeah. weed. Or, or weed. It, it's, it can be an addictive mind frame, but it's all about how you go into it. So I always say, do it within your friends and a, in a home space. Take it in small portions so you know what your body's experiencing and know what you're actually, like what that feeling is. So when you go to do it in a, in a public atmosphere, you know how to control yourself because at the end of the day, it is a dance. Mm. The drug is the, is the conductor of your orchestra and you better know how to play your music. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. And a lot of the people that you mentioned that you work for are people we consider as gay icons. Yes. So being in that party scene, being in that, in the mood, have you ever experienced someone going through a bad trip or going through a bad trip? Of journey? course, I've, I have definitely witnessed people in the entertainment industry or creative people, period, or um, business people utilize substance to take themselves to a space or a, mind, or a mind frame that is more creative than what you can tap into in, in a sober, sober mind. Cause mm. You know, a mind can be many of things. Yeah. And you don't have to. It doesn't have to. You don't have to be like on a level because you're on a drug. It just is what it is. But um, I have seen them utilize it, and it, it's it's something that they do to to get a creative component out of them to artistically express in a way through music, through art, through fashion, and connect with us as society in those ways that when you get your own personal experience, you'll understand what that is because you've now seen it from somebody else. But as you're in it within yourself, that energy will resonate. Yeah, and how do you get to that experience, but then when you reach that place, not want to depend on it? Like, can you, like, I know they say don't chase the high, yes. so that's when you get a little bit. I always say ride the wave, don't let the wave ride you. Ride mm -hmm. you. And that just basically means just do everything in moderation. Everything is in balance. You know, if, if, you're, if you're doing too much, you're, gonna, you're risking mm -hmm. overdosing. And there are certain drugs that you should not cross with each other because oh, yeah, of the component of chemicals. Again, you have to just be mindful of what you're putting in your body and just do your own research of what that is. It's just being very, very important to be knowledgeable. It is, it's sometimes, you know, that one thing when you're a little one, sometimes people would say, like, that's a dumb question. Mm -hmm. There is, and when it comes to this world of taking drugs and, and being knowledgeable by it, there is no dumb question that you can ask somebody. So if you have anybody, and I even with my doctors, mm. I talk to my doctors about my practices and I ask and I have these open conversations to let them educate me in how in ways I can possibly take it and do it in, in ways that I didn't know and mm. in ways that my friends didn't know. Yeah, Just educate yourself. So when you are with your doctor, and I know with healthcare, they are kind of iffy about drugs, mm, like they can't tell you to take them or or even, I don't even know if they can tell you how to use them, but how is openness create, creating some prevention and further harm? I think transparency with anybody, whether it's a doctor, a friend, a family member, a lover, a partner, whatever it is, it, transparency is, is, is imperative. And the approach that you take from that, you'll get an honest response. Mm -hmm. And rather, it's a good response or a bad response, it's an honest response. Yeah. And at least you're asking somebody that has medical background. Yeah. And I feel like your doctor should be a safe space like your best friend mm -hmm. or your Judy. So yeah, why not Judy. have these conversations yeah. with them? Uh, the thing I love about Deviant is that they do have hydration stations. Yes. It just takes away the stigma. Like yes. I said, the just say no thing. Like my, my education in drugs is I care cat, yeah. dare, just say no. And yeah. we've learned that that does not work. Where we can meet people where they are with the hydration station mm -hmm. and things like that. Is that something that's prevalent in the circuit scene? Absolutely not. And that's something that I love about Deviant is that they, they offer prevention before it gets to that. Mm. Other parties prepare for that. 
where they have ambulance and, and, oh, wow. and these EMTs on site to, to, to reach somebody that's overdosing. At that point, it's gone too far. Mm -hmm. At least with Deviant, they're giving you a safe space to, if anything is to happen, you have somewhere to go that you can hydrate yourself, that you can get an IV or replenish yourself or just a, even a cool space. They're very, they're very big on making sure that the space that they have any of their parties in is is conducive to fun, mm. but most importantly, etiquette and yeah. proper etiquette. And I think that's like, that's meeting people where you are. And I know we don't often use etiquette, like the word etiquette when it comes mm. to circuit or when it comes to those parties where we know we're gonna be doing things that we might not usually do. Mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful way to put it, humanizes it mm -hmm. more. Um, and because at the end of the day, we are all humans and we all do our own things. Like just because of one person's choice of, of high is their choice doesn't make it no different or better than the other person's choice of high. And there are people also in the circuit world or the deviant parties that are completely sober. Mm -hmm. You can be your own fucking high. You don't need to take a substance, but if you're choosing to do it, make sure, again, you're around a safe space and deviant offers that. Yeah. You don't feel like you're frowned upon if, you know, fucking, let's just be blunt. If you pull out your fucking bag and you do a little bump, you don't feel frowned upon where you're seeing other people have other parties where you're having to fucking just line up in a line and sneak into a quick restroom yeah. and do something excessively really fast and you don't even know what you're doing and you're doing it in an energy mind state that doesn't digest into your body the right way. Mm. At least where, where you're in a safe space, your body is releasing those type of pheromones. Again, I'm sorry, I'm very spiritual. I'm into Go the body with it. As well. Go with it. But your body is in a safe space, in, in, in a relaxed space, in a relaxed energy. So when you're doing it, you're getting the full experience of what you're supposed to get and not this like tight, yeah. tense situation or this, this thing that you're chasing or being in a space that you like, might have had a hard day. So now you just want to come get just fucking high and do whatever you do. No. Yeah. That's not the type of party Deviant is. Deviant is the party where you just come, you're welcome, everybody is accepted, your body is accepted, and whatever you choose to do, when you want to do it, where you want to do it, and how you want to do it, it's okay. I guess that creates safe space, too. I know working in nightlife, there, there, are, pro there are programs that try to teach us prevention, like try to teach people who bring people into these spaces how to deal with overdoses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like They offer... A lot of clubs and a lot of pro promoters, Narcan and mm -hmm. things like that, or test strips. Mm -hmm. Are there other measures we can take for someone who may not know that those things are available? If you're going out with your friends and yeah. for a night out and you want to try this thing for the first time. Yes. Um, well, I, well, I, think, I think that goes back to educating yourself or being surrounded by a community of people or walk of life that know the experience of what you're trying to indulge in. Mm -hmm. It's it's. The old saying is going to something blind is, is never the right way to do it, but going into something with some type of awareness of it or, or mindfulness of it, you understand what you're getting yourself into. Obviously, everybody's experience is, is, is individual, mm. but as long as you're around something or somebody that has that experience, your individual experience will be a collective because you're in a safe space. Talking to you is so easy. Talking to you is so easy about drugs, and it makes me want to like, okay, maybe if I try a little this and a little that, how do I do it safely? What should I never mix? Uh, you never want to mix G and alcohol. That's basically the date rape drug. That's mm -hmm. why a lot of these psychos are having to get themselves in situations. <laughs> <laughs> but truthfully, no, you do never ever mix G and, and, and alcohol. It's just the number one combination. It's absolutely not. And, and G is just one of those drugs that you just really do on its own. You don't want to mix it with anything else. It's just too risky because the chemical balance and that match with other things, it's just not safe. But there is a chart that has all of the drugs that complement each other and what doesn't complement each other. Mm. And I would say that should be prominent into any circuit party, rather it be, uh, not basically advertising circuit party, I think that should be something that you should educate yourself into before you step into a circuit party. Mm. So you know what you're getting yourself into. And you as a person with experience, would you take a newbie? Like, I'm a newbie. Of We're course, going I will hold your hand. Night. And I will hold your hand with you because I knew when I first stepped into that world, I didn't have that guidance. Mm. And I, I did things in its excessiveness. Mm. And I did not know how to control my high. I threw up profusely because that was my body rejecting things mm. that wasn't supposed to put into it. Had I known the right way to do it, I wouldn't have experienced it that way. And I wouldn't have been that scared going into it when I did it this, the next time. So it's again about education is so imperative. Yeah. It's not just something that's book sense. It's just life sense. Yeah. And that's why like, I think across the board, we figure out 
like I said before, just say no does not work. And they teach us that in the fifth grade. And mm -hmm. we go into the world and we find these things. And but we they don't teach that at the fifth grade. But in our communities, you can see different things happening. Yeah. And, and, and about the stigma. Because I don't want to be a person that stigmatizes. Yeah. So when you said G and ketamine and coke, my mind already went, my mind went to a place where like, <laughs> How can someone even do this and be a functioning person? But you seem to be, I don't, I'm not well, saying which, I don't know what you do or not. Again, but. anything in, this, in, in, in excessiveness mm. is addiction. People eat their fucking faces off mm. and they're still operable. They can operate. People drink and can still operate. Again, it's the fucking stigma that society has done to this world of drugs and, and just putting a, a negative stigma on it. And that's not what it really is. And there's a place in Europe. I forget the country, but they decriminalized all drugs. Yeah, that's what I wanted to they, it, Because they wanted it to be something that, at least if you're going to do it, you have a safe space to come do it. They literally have areas that you can actually come do these things, and they have doctors or medical professionals there just in case anything goes wrong. Yeah, and I'm guessing they offer the support on Yeah, just like the hydration place. station mm -hmm. instead of just the EMT being there when it, and it's too late. No, no, it's just a, like the safe space. Yeah, because even walking around like Harlem, if you leave your house and you live in Harlem at like 6, 7 a.m., you see people out here trying to get their fix um, from clinics. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of disheartening and sad because I know it doesn't have to be like that. I know there are drugs in poor communities, but there is no, there's no urge to fix it unless it like, reaches wide and richer communities. But I, even then, honey, a lot of those business corporate people, again, I worked in the entertainment industry for a long time, they survive off of that as well. We pull long hours, and, and mm -hmm. there's just no fucking way. That's how I was feeling today. That, production is long hours, and like Listen, my mind, I was like, you know. <laughs> but again, it's in, it's in moderation, and at least when those type of people are getting things, they're getting quality product. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Be just be conscious of anything that you put in your body, and make sure it's of quality. So let's say someone's having a bad day. Someone's having a day they can't cope with. Mm -hmm. Is that the time to try to do a new drug? I wouldn't say that it's the time to do a new drug. I think that's the time to lean on a friend mm -hmm. and talk. And if you want to experience a drug or euphoric moment in that type of level or, or that mindset, make sure, again, it's in a safe space, never by yourself. Because you just never know where your mind will take you and your mind is, is an infinite thing and sometimes can be a dangerous thing too. So what is drug safe? If you have to sum up <clears throat> drug safety mm -hmm. in a context for a person who's going out to these parties, a newbie, or maybe someone who hasn't been able to experiment because of whatever blockages they had. What is drug safety to you? Drug safety to me is to make sure, first and foremost, that you're around a community or people, places, or things. That's a safe space. And that safe space can be a home or wherever you're at. It's just a safe space. And from there, understanding what you're putting into your body. Just don't take it from somebody that just randomly came up to you just to make a quick sale. Make sure you're getting it from a source that mm. is somebody that you can trust and lean on. And then from there, bitch, ride the roller coaster and have fun. Yeah. I, I <laughs> like that you talked about the source, though, because I had a question about that. Yes. Like, you know, out in the club, people might give you coke or someone you don't know. Oh, it's, it's common. You... Because also in the circuit world, it is a very inclusive space. People are checking on you, talking, talking to you, make sure you're okay, or asking if you need anything. But some people's tolerance are different and some people are higher and lower and some people can take more things than the other person so again it's just you're not gonna the old fucking we learned this as kids don't fucking take candy from a stranger yeah so what does drug addiction look like in a person oh excessive it takes over your life it becomes all of you and you lose sense of yourself um, anything done in that type of capacity is very dangerous for any person. Rather, and it's not just drugs, anything excessive. Mm -hmm. But somebody that has a drug addiction, um, it's a very hard space to get out of. And I would advocate instead of just being so opinionated to somebody that's asking, seeking help, to be a true listening ear. Mm -hmm. Be present, be actively listening so that when you're responding, you're responding from a space of knowing what they're going through instead of basing off of what you know and your own personal experiences, then, then you're imprinting on that person. Mm -hmm. That's what I would really say. All right. Well, tell us how we can get in contact with you. Tell us where we can find some circuit tops. Oh, shit. Maybe okay, some well, circuit shit. bottoms, yeah, well, too. Circuit tops. Uh, I, my biggest platform is my Instagram, and mm -hmm. I utilize that. I have the IG store through that, and it's circuit tops underscore, oh, circuit underscore tops. Sorry, somebody fucking bought my circuit tops URL.
We Who dare you? Right. I'm gonna buy it back. <laughs> Anywho, yeah, circuit underscore tops. But personally, to follow me on my journey and who what, who I am and what I'm doing, you can follow me on Instagram. It's m silas twenty three m s i l a s two three. All right. Nice talking to you. I, nice I learned a lot. Thank so you. thank you so much. Of course. It's been a pleasure. It's been deviant. Deviant. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I love what Deviant does, like it has actual care. I know you do things in your event physically and bring people the care to where they are, but can you tell us where on your website we can find resources for people who may not be able to have access to you? Yes, yeah, certainly. At deviant.live backslash safety, you can actually find health and wellness resources in your local vicinity right now based in Atlanta, D.C., and New York City. So the, these are health and wellness partners that are in those local vicinities that can literally provide you harm reduction resources, everything from sexual health to drug safety. Um, very important that you all visit that part of the website. Uh, but also, I love that you bring up our events because we do have what are called hydration stations. It's intentionally named because if you take any substances, including alcohol, most substances will dehydrate you. So a, a general rule of thumb, be hydrated before you even begin drinking. Um, but at our events, we like to make certain that people have access to free water. If you go to these hydration stations, they're actually staffed by medical professionals, mm. uh, folks that can give you advice on what not to mix with your alcohol or what not to mix in general. Um, folks that can also give you information and resources um, of how to just better your life and, and have fun and live happy and be healthy. Last thing I'll mention here is that Queer youth are 90% more likely to use substances than heterosexuals, according to a meta-analysis study. When we talk about youth, we're talking about kids and adolescents. And this is why, I just, I, I highlight this to say that this is why we have to start talking about this conversation differently. Mm. We've got to remove stigma, and we've got to uplift information and education resources. I believe in that. Thank you all so mm. much for joining us on this episode of Deviant TV talking on drug safety. If you want to find out more, see more episodes, and even offer your voice on the subject matter, you will find the survey at deviant.live backslash play. Once again, deviant.live backslash play. You'll be able to see more episodes of Deviant TV, but also offer your voice on our survey. So looking forward to hearing from you. See you next time. See you on the next one. <laughs>